right, well, as you heard, my name is Mary Jo Black, and I'm here from Forsyth County Government. I work there as a GIS specialist, and that means that I help everybody in the county, especially anybody dealing with land, like parks and recs, planning, tax assessor's office. I help them look at their data spatially, and I help them make decisions about their data or what they need to do in the county. Um, I got into this job kind of in a roundabout way. I actually started way back in the day as a park ranger. The little outfit, the hat, the everything. Um, and what I learned is that I loved geography while I was doing that. Went back to school, got a master's degree in science uh, with a minor in geomatic engineering, which is the study of how you measure, map, and model the earth. And that brought me up to now. So as a GIS specialist and the people I work with in the field, know that geography is everywhere in everything you do and that you can get into all kinds of different professions because of it. Um, oh, I wanted to make a little note. Today I get to be a presenter. I'm not the teacher, that's his honor. So if you need to ask a question, if you want to raise a hand, I have a couple of participation things, feel free. Okay, so I'm going to start off with what is GIS? Okay, and you, you can take notes, but I'm not necessarily going to quiz you on oh, this they've later. Got, they've got something that I can Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> well, if you're thinking about GIS, you have to think about geography. And geography is all about where something is located, uh, why is it located there, how and why are these places different, and how do people interact with their environment, which is what I've heard you've been kind of looking at. So one of the ways we think about geography is we think about it with a map, and that's cartography. So cartography, the first maps, rocks, rock walls, clay tablets. Um, and if you think about it, as a human population, pretty much as soon as we were able to write, we started making maps. So this is hugely important to us. Um, those first maps, they're used as topographic. Where are things? Um, celestial, what is up there in the sky? And the, the cosmographic maps, those are always the, the really interesting ones where it's like a turtle swimming with half a continent on its back and there's a bear floating in the air above it. You know, people are trying to figure out where they related to the universe. Um, oops, wait. This map in particular, you probably recognized it. Uh, that's actually Babylonia, the big rectangle in the center. The thing crossing over it is the Euphrates River. If you look very carefully around the edges, you see little circles, and those are the adjacent kingdoms. So this was telling the people of Babylonia where they were, conveniently in the center, and then where the other kingdoms are in relation to them, and the major feature of their area, which was Euphrates River. Now why, 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 starting way back then, did we start making maps? Those first maps were celestial. They helped us determine things like the change of season. And why would that have been important to the first man? Yes? Because a lot of them were mostly agricultural. Mostly agricultural, hunter-gatherers. You need to know when the seasons were changing. You need to know what was coming up. You needed to be able to move, perhaps, with the seasons or to follow whatever you're hunting wherever it goes. Um, nautical maps, some of the first maps. Why? Because we like to go places. Because going places gets us things like wealth or food or supplies. Nautical maps are very important. Military maps, obvious driver of the human race. Um, and just, you know, it's pretty much easier to win if you know where your enemy is or their supplies are. So the better your maps are, the better your military is. <coughs> And commerce. We like money, lots of money, and maps help us make money. And if you think about it, any map you look at, if you look at it carefully, is pretty much a treasure map. Um, but I want you to think about that clay tablet and that beautiful rendering of Babylonia and the Euphrates. It was a little hard to read, and what did it really tell you about those kingdoms that were surrounding it? Because they all looked pretty much to me about the same distance away. Do you think that's true? No. Um, part of map making is expressing something to give me information. So the information I got from that was there are other kingdoms. I didn't really understand how far away they were. 
One of the things, big deals in map making is projections. Projections is all about math and making that map accurate and mean something. Um, big breakthrough, Mercator, back in the 1500s. A uh, Flemish cartographer, amazing guy, changed the way we ma make maps, took us into a whole new nautical era, and it's all based on his mathematical models. So one thing I'd like to point out, you've probably already done this, but when you're looking at maps, you have to think, because projection matters. So when I'm measuring, if I look here at Greenland and here in Africa, that's always one of my personal litmus tests, because in real life, Africa is 14 times larger than Greenland. So if I'm looking at that map and I see Greenland is about two thirds the size of Africa, I can see the distortion. Because these are these flat things, these maps, these are, these are our best model of the Earth. Are they round? They're flat. And the Earth is. So you're always going to get some kind of distortion. So the trick is to figure out which mathematical model is going to ex best express how you want to draw your map. So this is a meaningful map. It does show us the world. It lets us kind of know where things are relatively. Um, when our math got better, we were able to develop different projections. This one, particularly accurate. You can see Greenland is much smaller. It's at a better place. Um, and depending on where you're working here in Forsyth County, we use a state plane projection. I walked in and saw this map. It had a heart attack. The county is like seven times fatter than any map I've ever made. Uh, and I have a friend who works for the railroad. Think about it. New York down to Florida, New York down to Florida. How's that running? What direction? North-South. That's right. So you wouldn't want a projection which skewed east-west. So they use a really bizarre projection called Albers Equal Area. So they get the most accurate north-south rendering of those railroad tracks because every inch that they misdraw, you get, now you have to order supplies. Now it costs money. Um, and I see you a little bit blazing over with talk about math and Flemish cartographers. And I know you're thinking these maps don't matter and they don't relate to you, but they do. Maps are important. And maps are everywhere, even in hilarious internet jokes. Or at least they're hilarious to people like me. Um, uh, oh, stop, think. Think where, back in the day, rewind your history, where was the first map you ever saw? Can you think about where you saw your first map? Hey, hey Joe, I got one. Any, anyone? All right. A puzzle. A puzzle. OK, excellent. Can you like the map of the pace or like where you saw like What pace it's showing you? Oh, no, no, where you were when you saw a map. Uh, yes. So you were at home. OK. Yes. Uh, the, mall. the mall. OK. So you were out and about commerce. Um, well, for me, I remember my first map that I ever saw was at church. So a big map of you know the Holy Land. If you look in the Bible, it was filled with maps. And those always stuck out to me because they were the colored things in the Bible. They were fun to look at. But if you think about it, religion, it's very cultural. Maps are cultural, and they're important to us. Um, and maps are in the arts, they're in fashion. Look around, open your eyes. After you leave this class, I'll put this in your brain and now you'll suddenly see maps everywhere. Maps are in art for art's sake. I love the one on the far left, the black and white. That is actually a quilt the artist made of an aerial photograph of her neighborhood <coughs> showing the houses that were destroyed in a wildfire. So she used maps and geography to be able to express in her medium you know, what happened to her in her life. Uh, maps are in literature. Why do you think they're in literature? Because it makes it real for us. If we can see a map of all these crazy places or really think of Middle Earth as real and understand the relationships of the di different kingdoms or whichever books you like to read, you're going to find maps in them. Ah, and speaking of finding maps everywhere, we're going to do an activity and make a map. So. I'm going to pass out a piece of paper. I think that's, I'm just going to hand a wad. If there's more, when you get to the end, just send the empties back to me. All right. When you receive your paper, 
That is like me giving you a badge. You are now deputized as junior cartographers. What I need you to do is you're going to take one pen or one pencil, one writing implement, your choice, and you're going to make me a map. You're going to make a map of how to get from this school to your house. Did everybody get a piece of paper? Are we good? All right, because just to make it more interesting, we're going to time you. You have five minutes. And begin. Thank you. Is it the parking lot? Oh, okay. No pressure, just 30 seconds left. Just keep going. Seconds.
Apple says time is up. Okay. And so, how do you think you did? Anybody particularly proud of them now? Want to show me? Anybody? All right. Hold it up. Oh, good. All right. We went treasure map style. I like that. Especially the palm tree. Anybody else? Could it, anything? Okay, I like that one. That one's good. Well, let's evaluate your maps, and I'll let you evaluate your own. I won't come to everybody. But there are some main cartographic elements that as geographers and cartographers, we try to include in a map. Sorry, I'm standing in people's way. So if you look down at your map, did you happen to put a title on it? Would somebody looking at your map know what it was supposed to be conveying to them? You know, map of South Forsyth to Mary Jo's home. Anything? Is there a legend? Do you need a legend on it? Not every map needs a legend, but a lot of times they do. How about orientation? Did anybody slap a north arrow on that? There's not a single north arrow in this whole room. <gasps> For shame. Okay, what about scale bar? Scale, did anybody give me a scale? Tell, tell me how, how far. So you just made a big old Babylonian map, didn't you? That's what I got, okay? And of course the other big cartographic element is what you're trying to show. In this case, it's the United States, that mapped area. Um, I did see that some of you used wonderful labels. Labels are very important in mapping. They help tell me this is the school, this is the house. I saw a couple of people even put a label on a road. And they're also something to think about because the first thing you want to think about before you make a map is what are you trying to tell and who are you trying to tell it to. So if on your map to your house you said leave the high school and go past the Starbucks, well now you're making an assumption about your audience. You're assuming I know what a Starbucks is, that I've been here before, or you know, if you just put a direction arrow and not the name of the road, that you think I'm going to be able to follow that and keep going. Did the road name change, like 141 to Bethelview? Would I be freaked out if you didn't show me the change of road names when I crossed that street? So cartography is about thinking about your message, what are you trying to tell people, and what people are you trying to tell it to. When I'm making maps, I'll make a very different map for a county commissioner who's stared at this county and can tell you every road and byway and, and pond than I might make for your class. I might make a very different generalized map for you guys because you, you don't have as much experience looking at the area and it wouldn't be meaningful to you. So I want whatever I make to be meaningful to the audience I'm giving it to. Oh, sorry, other critical thing, when you're looking at maps, what is the data source? Because maps are just like statistics. You can lie, 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 lie with a map. You better make sure you know what that data was, that it came from, and that it's cited. So cartographic challenges, which you're now aware of, um, is setting the map's agenda. You know, what is it you're trying to express? Are you trying to express something that's topological? Are you drawing streets, rivers, houses? Are you trying to express something that's abstract, like a county boundary? I mean, you know there's no line right here if you drive over, right? It's, it's just a make-believe line. So these are abstract concepts, the, the counties, the states, the countries. Are you trying to express that? Um, when you represent the terrain, what projection are you using? Did you have a projection in a scale? Is it just going to give me a general idea of how to get to here from there? Or is it going to tell me the actual length and miles so I can think about how much time that might take me? Um, oh, I noticed when you drew your map, you didn't draw every street, every house, every business between here and there. This is a fundamental concept of map making. You generalized. And you have to, right? What, what would it I mean? That would just be an aerial photograph, right? If you took it to get me to your house, and there's probably more data there than I need, it wouldn't actually be helpful to get me where I was going. So when you make your map, you're actually going to take away some information. And the second part of that is in the uh, reducing the complexity. Can I use yours just for one second? His, his road is probably pretty accurate it's doing this. Her road, she's generalized it. She's made it straight because the truth is, Maybe I didn't need to know that it's going to go swervy, swervy, swervy. I just need to stay on that road to get to your house, right? 
so when you're making maps, you're going to generalize features in it as well as the actual items you put in it. Okay. All right, so cartography, it, it's going to build on the premise that we can describe around Earth and its components on a flat map. And it does this through spatial data. But what is spatial data? Spatial data is data that has a location. How many of it? Where is it? What is it? Um, spatial data has scale. You know, is it just this area? Is it the school? Is it the county? Is it the state? Um, you can present spatial data in different methods. I talk a lot about maps, but I could actually make you a graph. I could make you a chart. I could print out a table for you. I just happen to think maps often express spatial data very well. And if you think about data in general, about 80% of data does have a spatial component. You know, the road, your car, you know, all these things, where is it? Where was it? Where will it be? Um, and when we're talking about spatial data, I really want to, if you have to write one thing down to remember it, the whole point of it is to think about something come up with an answer, make a decision, and take action. So this is probably one of the most famous maps on Earth. I put it here because it looks to me a lot like your maps, and I want you to understand that maps don't have to be big and colorful or crazy to be really significant. What they have to do is tell a story and help make decisions. So if you don't recognize it, this is a map of Soho, London in 1853. Uh, it was drawn by Dr. John Snow. And he was faced at that time with a cholera outbreak. So that should be something a little familiar to us. We've been dealing with the Ebola outbreak. So this was back in the day, the first time. Cholera, cholera outbreak. Cholera, anybody remember? They probably didn't play Oregon Trail, did they? Think of it, stomach flu times a billion. Horrible death. Horrible death. Don't want that. So at, at the time, people are dying. It's really horrible. Everybody's freaking out. And there are two competing theories. If you look carefully up here, you'll see the green box. That green box represents an area where 150 years earlier, they had buried the bodies of bubonic plague victims and then built over it. So one of the theories was that there were vapors coming out from those dead plague people that were now plaguing everybody else. The second theory was Dr. Snow's. Can you see the little black dots scattered around? Those are pumps, wells, for water. So what he did was say, I think the water might be the problem. I'm going to plot as a point every person who has died of cholera. So these are where these people live that are dying. And then he asked himself, where did they get their water? And when he drew a line from their house to a pump, suddenly it became pretty darn clear. That pump in the center, that's the Broad Street pump. It was killing everybody with cholera. So what he was able to do was take this information, walk down to Broad Street, and pull the handle off the pump, stopping the ep epidemic and saving lives, and creating the science of epidemiology, as well as, well as uh, GIS, too. So this is kind of a famous map and a famous analysis. and. It's really important, not just because it was the first and it saved lives, but because it saved lives as well. If you think about Ebola today, we're pretty concerned about that. We're concerned about outbreaks, how diseases move. It's still very relevant. Now, one thing I always like to emphasize is that Dr. Snow, it took him a week to do this because he had to do it all by hand. Now, with computers, we can do things much faster. Um, and Dr. Snow was kind of answering his own one simple question, where did they drink? because he had an idea it was from the water. What if he had had to look at workplaces or if they went to school? If he had had more points that he had to put in there, it would have taken even longer. So one of the beauties of today is that we have geographic information systems, which implies that they're computer-based, which makes everything better. Um, and just to go over the definition, a GIS is a system designed to capture, store, manipulate, analyze, manage, and present all types of geographic data. Um, 
there are five essential components to a GIS. And everybody's pretty familiar with the hardware. You need a computer, you need a server, you need some place to keep this data. You're gonna need software, right? You're gonna need like a Google Map software, or I use Esri Arc Maps, something where I can put data in and then figure out how far away something else is. So I need software that'll help me interact with this data. I need the data itself. If I don't know where the fire hydrants are, I can't tell you how far away your house is. If it's more than five miles, you may not get as good of an insurance rate because you're not gonna get help as quickly as you need. So I need data to use in my system. Very important. This is science, people. Geography, cartography, GIS. Science, I need methodology. How am I using this data? You know, is it correct? Is it, am I running statistics on it? What are my methods? How am I getting to my results and my conclusions? And most importantly are the people. You need thoughtful people who are running, putting all these components together and running your GIS. So when you're looking at a complete GIS system like we have here at the county, um, what it is doing is taking many, many different types of data layers. You can see the top layer is land use. Uh, is it a commercial area? Is it a residential area? Is it a park? Land use is very important for what we do now and what we plan to do in the future. Streets. Where are the streets? How many streets? How big are the streets? Are they big enough to not have bad traffic? <laughs> so lots of data about streets. And of course, you want to know what political district you, you're in, who's your commissioner, uh, where are your house is, where's your parcel? What's your parcel value worth? What are you paying for your house and your taxes? All of these are very important things. We try to take all that data and put it together so that we can give results and analysis to folks. Um, a lot of this comes back down to database management. When you have a county full of data with every address point, every parcel, every road, it's big. It's not gonna happen on your computer or on your laptop. So there's a lot of database management that goes on. But the most important thing we do is spatial analysis. I always say it doesn't do me any good to have the best data, tons of data, if I don't do anything with it, if I'm not asking it questions. And the reason why GIS is so amazing is because if you look at data in reality, see that table? Ooh, that's a fascinating, right? No. Okay. And, and what does it even mean? What is it trying to tell you? It's, it's, you're not getting a lot of information from that. But if I can put it into a map, if I can show you that same data and lay it out, I can maybe tell you something and help you make a decision. So here's all that same boring data out of the table thrown up on the left side is your census data from 2000 for your senior population. We are not seniors. We're talking about the really old people. We're still young. Um, so you can see 2000. You can see a couple of dense areas of seniors, but pretty much evenly scattered throughout the county and not a lot of them. If you look over at 2010, do you see a lot more dark globs? Got, so we've got more density um, and we've got more total seniors in the county now. Why does this matter? Well, if you're going to think about senior services, you want to think of who are my people and where are my people? And if you're thinking of where, you can see pretty much the south end of the county has a large total, and also that west side now has a large total, big growth. If you look into the colored map on the right, you see that the three senior centers, they're really serving the people in the dark colored areas. The lighter colored areas have to go much farther to get them, and so they're looking at trying to figure out where they would want to put new senior centers to serve people in the county. So it's helping commissioners make decisions by showing you know, what was there, what is here now, and maybe what we need to be planning for in the future. Um, when you're talking about a GIS system, you're talking about two distinct types of data. You have raster data. That's what you're used to looking at. It's the pixels. It's the aerial photograph that you see on big maps or on Google Maps. And these are all created with little tiny pixels. And we do types of analysis on this where I look for, um, like if they say we've lost 70% of the tree cover in the United States in the past 50 years. Pretty typically what they've done is they've taken a photograph and, and just analyzed the pixels and then compared them to today's picture. The second type of data we have are vector data. Those are points, lines, and polygons. 
So your houses, your roads, your parcels, your political boundaries. And that's what we overlaid for the senior centers, you know, showing you know, what's a dis distance from here, buffer that point out. Um, and again, we're focused on turning data into information. So here's an example of one of the analysis that we performed in our particular department. This is analysis for the fire department. You can see fire station five in the center, the little red dot, and you see its area. And this area is everybody within five miles of the station. That's kind of the standard. So they started asking the question, that station is really small. It's not, you know, they can't grow it. They can't move. They'd like to move it so they can get a better facility with you know, new equipment to better serve the public. But if we move it, what would happen? Because you can already see the change. There's the shape of the old one. There would be the shape of the new one. So it's going to impact it, even if you move it just a little bit. So this map is going to show you the difference between those two areas. So you can see the, the center middle color is the area that is currently covered. The white area up on the top, or the pinky area, that would be new area that's covered. And then if we moved it, we would lose all that dark orange color. So we're thinking, wow, well, what does that really mean? I see a lot of blobs on the, on the page, but is that bad? Is that good? What does it mean? So we break it down to the human component. So we can see here, the little black dots now are houses, and we can look at total population. So you can see the numbers look a little, little weird. If we change that station, we're going to lose coverage to over 2,000 people, or 5,000 people, and only add 2,000. So to start with, I'm thinking, well, that doesn't sound like a good idea then. It'd be nice to have a bigger station and better equipment, but we shouldn't lose population while we're doing this. So the final question we asked ourselves was, well, you know, Fire Station 5, there are a bunch of other ones. It's, it's one of 12, I think. So where are those other fire stations? Would they cover any of this area? So if you look now, you see we overlaid the other fire stations. They're overlapping five mile radius. And you can see there's only one tiny black polygon at the top, that black square showing where we would actually lose a five mile coverage. It turns out if you look at those numbers, we only lose 26 buildings and 76 people, but we gain 731 buildings and over 2,000 people. So it turns out it really is better to move that fire station, have better equipment, be better able to serve, and we got more people in there anyway. So that's the kind of thing we're trying to do with specific data here at the county. So the goals of GIS, pointed at that, like it's gonna help. Uh, is to help people and companies do their work better, faster, and cheaper by visualizing the data that they have, by managing their data, and by being able to analyze it. And by analyzing it, that means you have information that you can make a decision on and that you can take action from. You're gonna take action, right? Next time you see a map, you're gonna be really excited. Uh -huh. Oops. All right, so that's kind of the GIS portion of it. What is GIS in review? It's a science based in geogra geography, has a lot to do with cartography. It's information system based in computers. It's built of five major components. Anybody remember a component? Hardware. Hardware. Software. Data, people, methods. methods. Rock it in. Man. Give yourself a hand. <laughs> Seriously. And there are two types of data that we use in GIS. Raster, Raster and vector. vector. Yes, OK. So that's GIS broken down in a nutshell. Comprised of five different things. It uses two types of data. And the whole intent of it is to answer questions so that you can take actions. The second kind of portion of the program here is to look into uh, addressing that we do at the county. And addressing is interesting to me because it's very cultural and, and, and it's also systematic. So I wanted to introduce you to addressing, which is something I know a little about. So first we're going to discuss 
What is an address? An address is a collection of information presented in a mostly fixed format used for describing the location of a building, apartment, or structure, generally using political boundaries and street names as references, along with other identifiers such as house or apartment numbers. You got all that? So it's a collection of information in a fixed format describing a building or structure, and it, or it's used for describing a building or structure, and it's usually described by a street, a political boundary, such and such. So the history of addressing. If you think about it, addressing is a relatively new concept. Back in Babylonia, nobody had an address. This is new. Um, early addresses were only as early as the 15th century, and those weren't even real addresses. That was more rich people kind of keeping track of the land they owned. It wasn't to help people find things. It really wasn't until the 18th century. I mean, that blew me away when I realized that. That's, that's really new. 18th century, we first started addressing things. But never mind, I see your eyes glazing over. So instead, we'll do a pop quiz instead of learning about the history of addresses. Because I see you. I see you don't think this is relevant or fun. But it is. You will love addresses by the time we're done. Oh, and remember when I said I wouldn't quiz you about this stuff? I lied. I'm a fibber. Fibber McFibbington. You should throw down it back at him. Tell him to take the quiz with you. See how he does. <laughs> All right, so everybody has your quiz sheet. Everybody has put your name on it. Everyone is super stoked for this. Oh, come on, come on. It could be fun. <laughs> So here's a trick, you've got your sheet of paper, write it down, I'm going to give you an address. I'm going to tell you an address and you are going to tell me the significance of the address, the people or the significance of the address when you see it. And zip, 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 there'll be no chit chat chat, you just write it down on your paper and keep going. So, first address, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Why is that address important? Who lives there? What you got? Write it down. Mm -hmm. it, you, can, you can tell me that, that there's a person who lives there or that's got some other significance. So this address will either be the address of a person or it'll be a significant address for another reason. All right, number two, for Privet Drive, the Twinging Surrey. Why is that significant? Who lives there? Four Privet Drive, comma, I see some of you. I see some of you. 263 Prinzengracht in Amsterdam. Why is that significant? Number 10 Downing Street, London, England. Number 10 Downing Street in London, England. Really, a shocking amount of black stair blank stairs. All right, we'll keep going. 221B Baker Street, also London, England. Who lives there? Eleven Wall Street. What significant thing is there? What is significance? I'll give you a hint. That one's not a person, it's an item of significance. Eleven Wall Street. Number seven, one, two, four, Kong Street, Bikini Bottom, Pacific Ocean. Who lives, who lives there? Come on. <laughs> Number eight, Ben Along Point in Sydney, Australia. What famous structure? I'll give you a hint on that one. What famous structure is there?
Okay, take a last look at this one, fill in any of your questions. We're gonna keep moving because it's a game of speed and excitement. All right, number nine. What is it? 1060 West Addison Street, Chicago. You'll know it for many reasons, but one of them could be your film fan. 1060 West Addison Street, famous address. 3734 Elvis Presley Boulevard in Memphis, Tennessee. What could that be? No way to know. No way to know. 14 Maple Street, Mayberry, North Carolina. 14 Maple Street, Mayberry, North Carolina. Seven forty two Evergreen Terrace in Springfield. Springfield. Three fifty Fifth Avenue, New York. Three fifty Fifth Avenue, New York. I'll give you a hint that one's a structure. What famous structure? Number 14, 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney. Who lives there? Why is that significant? Sixteen thirty, Revelo Drive in Sunnydale, California. Sunnydale. Fourteen oh seven Gray Malkin Lane, Salem Center, New York. Oops, sorry. All right, last chance on those. Look through them. Anything? Anything? Scribbling? All right, keep going. Ah, who lives at that one thousand seven? I'm so sorry. Mountain Drive in Gotham. Who could possibly live in Gotham? Twenty-three eleven North Los Robles Avenue, apartment four A, apartment four A in Pasadena. Who lives there? Three hundred one Cobblestone Way in Bedrock. Bedrock. Okay. 933 Hillcrest Drive, Beverly Hills, California. 933 Hillcrest Drive, Beverly Hills. Bonus questions. If you can tell me who lives in galactic sectors, Z, Z, 9, plural Z, alpha, mostly harmless. And who can tell me what, as your second bonus question, we would find if we went to the second star to the right and straight on till morning. All right, last chance for the slides. Do you want to take them up or do you want me just to go through the answers? Or? All right. Do you, do you want them to grade it while we go? Okay. Are they are they self grading? Are they self grading? All right. We're trusting you, man. We're trusting you. So and I'm sure you guys rocked it, and I'll let you start yelling it out. 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is. The White House. That's right. Four privet. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. <laughs> ah, this is for the history buffs. 263 Prince and Guard, Amsterdam. What? An important person. Who? Anne Frank. Anne Frank. Who said it? Absolutely, it's Anne Frank. 
Number 10, Downing Street. Downing Street. Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. 221B Baker Street. Sherlock Holmes, absolutely. 11. New York Stock Exchange. Who said that? All right, that's exactly right. The New York Stock Exchange, the center of American commerce, 11 Wall Street. Oh, I'm sorry. Who lives in a pineapple deep under the sea? Come on. And if you were wondering, Squidward is 122 Cox Street. What is that? Been a long point. Sydney, Australia. Sydney, Australia. That's correct. Who knew this one? Anyone? Nope. Uh, it was mentioned in the Blues Brothers movie. This is the address they always gave out because it's not a real address. It is Wrigley Field. Graceland, and I would accept Elvis Presley as well. But Graceland was really what I was hoping for. Who lives here? Ding. Mayberry, North Carolina, famous fictional town. <laughs> Come on, somebody got this. Who got this? The Simpsons. Empire State Building, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, because everybody knows two addresses, your own and 42 Wallaby Way. Ah, who is from Sunnydale? Not even you? Betrayal. Betrayal. When am I old school? Buffy. Come on. Ah, come on, who knew this one? Somebody who, I need a comic book or movie fan. Michael Jackson. Not Michael Jackson. James Bond. That, that's the, uh, the center. Thank you, yes. And along the same theme, who lives? The Dark Knight. Yeah, technically. Ah. Come on, this this was current. I actually threw you a bone here. Ding, that's right. It all started with the Big Bang. They've mentioned it in three episodes. They live in the town of Bedrock. Who's here? Nobody? All right, perhaps it would have helped if I'd given you the zip code with this one. Oh, that's right, the Walsh family from our favorite television drama. Who got it? I don't know. I don't know if I got it right. You did? Just say it. Just say it. Trick question, it's all of you because that's the description of Earth from Douglas uh, Adams. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and the last one, what would you find if you went here? Peter Pan, Peter Pan you would go to Neverland. <laughs> you want to take them? Okay. 
guys are wearing me out. All right. Ooh. Okay, so seriously, wait, 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 wait. Okay, and we're back. Um, so what, what, where were those addresses from? What, what, were, what were they? They were political addresses, right? 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, 10 Dowling Street. Where else were they from? Uh, pictures, TV, literature. So whether it's real, whether it's imaginary, addresses are important, and we think about addresses all the time. And this is important to you because, honestly, addresses, they are a defining characteristic of us all. They define you just like your hair, your eyes, your height. It tells something about you. Um, addresses are also used as an important part of your personal identification. Think of all the things that are based on your home address, where you vote, how you, what's on your driver's license, that address is everywhere. Um, if you really still don't believe addresses are important, you know, think about it. The British call it postcode envy, where they talk about you know, wanting to live in a better neighborhood and, um, or a Park Avenue address here in America. So we, we think about addresses a lot. And your address tells me something, like if you're from Caribou Port and Reindeer Road and Deer Drive, if I see that on a piece of paper, I'm going to guess that these three might be in the same subdivision. That's probably a fairly new subdivision because those have kind of trendy names that are all to a theme. So your address tells me something about you and who you are near or with. Oh, if you tell me your address is Oak Street, now you have my attention. That's kind of a primordial address. Does anybody here live on an Oak Street? Nope, because that's usually one of the first streets in the city. So there's probably one way up and coming that's this big. So it tells me you live in an older part of town and that that's Charleston, South Carolina, it tells me you live in a nice old part of town. So addresses can tell people a lot about you. And if you still don't think that's true right here in Forsyth County, look at this map carefully. And at this point, <clears throat> giant disclaimer, giant disclaimer, I am a county employee. You are looking at United States zip codes. Nothing to do with me, not a thing. So as just an ordinary person, when I look at this map, I cannot help but see, you're seeing it, right? Down at the south end. Every other zip code is this giant, big, beautiful blob, big blobs next to each other, blah, 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 except donut. Anybody know what that is? That's Duluth, right in the middle of Forsyth County. So somebody got the federal government to change a policy so that they could say they had a different address than coming. So right here in Forsyth County, people are all up in the business about what your address means. But addressing why, why, why is she even talking about this? Why is it important? Addressing is very important. Uh, it helps you. you. It helps you get home, school, home, school, Starbucks, wherever you want to go. Um, it's also very important for emergency service. It saves your life. If I know where you are, I can send a fire truck. If I know where you are, I can send an ambulance. So addresses are critical for emergency services. And they're also critical for commerce, which is actually most of the driving factor behind addressing. If I know where you are, I can send you supplies, I can sell you something. Um, if you can tell me where you are, you can make me bring you pizza. So your address is important to you to get goods and services. Oh, sorry, I forgot, governments. <laughs> governments also kind of think addresses are important because it improves our management ability and it increases our revenues. If we know where you are, we can get you water and electricity and emergency services. If we know where you are, we can also tax you, right? We're going to do just a little bit of history, but it's very interesting, I promise. So American addressing. When, when did we start doing this? Technically, the English had a little bit of a system when we were colonies, but that was mostly like they would send it to the, the common house in one of the big colonies in Virginia. So not everybody had an address and it didn't really help people. Um, what happened next? Big deal, kind of a big deal, the American Revolution. So suddenly, we're our own country now. Suddenly, we're fighting the British, we're in a war. Suddenly, people want information. 
And actually, once again, it comes back to commerce. You'd think it'd be about the military, and it kind of was. It's really about the journalists, because you want to know what's happening. Are the British winning? Are we winning? Am I British? Am I American? What's going on? So you want to buy a newspaper. So the journalists were all hot and heavy up in Philadelphia back in the day to get these buildings and homes addressed so they could sell their product. So beginning around 1805 in the United States, that's when our home numbering system began. And, and again, for us even, this was really started out in the urban areas, like think Philadelphia, it's where things are happening. Um, we kind of inherited the European model, which is interesting. The, the Europeans at that point realized, oh, what else is happening around this time, especially in Europe? Kind of a big deal. That's it, the Industrial Revolution. Love that guy. <laughs> so uh, once again, it's about money. Industrial Revolution's happening. People are getting wealthy. People now want to keep track of that wealth. They want to have you bring stuff to them and spend that wealth. Um, so Europe starts pushing this addressing system, and they start going. And you can see the traditional Euro European style is odd numbers on the left even numbers on the right, and you just count. There's a house that's number one, there's a house that's number two. So you're just going up and down the street, giving everything a number. Um, and there's a little bit of a struggle in Europe because remember, how old's Paris? You know, how old's London? You know, these things are a billion years old. So they're having to kind of retrofit these addresses in. They're make, trying to make these systems work. While in the United States, we got it figured out. We're the new kid, so we start planning. Planning is key when it comes to addresses because it makes all the difference in the world. If you look at Washington, D.C., planned it out of Philadelphia, that was our first nation's capital. This is what we have now. It was very well thought out, and they thought it out in a grid system. They numbered the streets consecutively, either with letters or with numbers. And the diagonal streets are named after Pennsylvania states. states. And those are even mostly in alphabetical order, too. So the whole thing, when you're there, you can figure out where you're going. If it's, you know, 1000 C Street, you know, you're going to the 10th block and then to C Street. So the addresses make sense. It's like a little grid pattern. It guides you to where you're going. So when they planned out DC, they planned out the streets. As we mentioned before, streets aren't the only part of the address. It's your address number. We talked about the European style, top left. There was another European style that's very popular, uh, especially in the outskirts of London, or England, the more rural areas. And it's bizarre. They go up one side of the street and then down the other. The problem with that is, wouldn't it be kind of hard if you're looking for a number in the middle? You, you don't really know where it's going to land. So it's, it's not as predictable. And most of us now go with this bottom idea, which is it's not the house on the street. It's the range of the street. So if a street is from 6,000 to 7,000, and it's a mile long, well, the house in the middle is going to be 6,500. So you break it down by location. And what do you think drives that mathematical formula down there for making addresses? Probably have one in your car. Probably have one on your phone. GPS, because now we have the computers that are predicting. So let's say we build new houses. Your data isn't always up to date. I mean, we don't have those actual buildings. But if you tell me your address that you want me to go to is 6,500, I know I just have to go to the street and go to the center of it, right? So now we have a predictable address that we can model with. Oh, house numbers. Think of your house. Where is your house number? Does anybody have a house number on their actual home? Used to? It doesn't happen so much anymore. <clears throat> Used to, everyone had it on their actual building. It was usually on a little black box by your front door. It's about this big. And what went in that little black box? Your mail, because it was the little postal guy out walking around every house, dropping off the mail. Yeah, because, well, think about it. It was, what, 1805? So you had people walking around, and you had a couple of horses, maybe. So 
Yeah, it didn't have to be very complicated. Um, so now your numbers have moved out to the street on the mailbox. Why is that? Right, male people are driving cars now. And also, who else is driving cars? Are you guys driving cars yet? All right. So, so when you're driving your car, you want to be able to see those addresses too. So you want them out front where you can see them. Also, typically, numbers are larger. If you go to an old historic area, look at the house numbers. They're not particularly big. You know, but now if you see an actual house number on a house, it's like a two and a half foot number sitting out there so you can see it from the road while you're going 50 miles an hour. Oh, and commercial addresses. Think about how big they make their addresses. They want you to know where they are. Okay, so to identify addresses, um, we're gonna look at three major components. It's the street name itself. And when you're thinking about street names, you want them to be unique, because how helpful is it to have 53 Peachtree streets? Not helpful. And you want them to be patterned, because that makes them predictable. Um, when I moved to Forsyth County, I was having a, I'm like, I just don't get it. I'm not, you know, I was having trouble getting around. I finally realized, yeah, there's no grid system. There are no street names. People just name streets as they wanted. So if you tell me you're on Elk Street, that's just Elk Street. <laughs> I, I can't, in my mind, picture anywhere in the county that would be. Whereas, like, we talked about D.C., where they planned it out. So if you tell me you're at 10,000 C Street, I need to go to the 10th block in C Street, and I can find your house. Um, I'm actually from Gainesville, Florida. Gainesville, Florida is the same way. It's on a grid system. Everything is numbered. Uh, avenues run north-south, roads run east-west. So everything about an address tells me something about how to get there. So it's completely predictable, really easy to find stuff. Why do you think cities like Gainesville, Florida, and Washington, D.C. put such a major thought and planning and effort into these predictable addresses? What do you think is driving them? Commerce to a point. Yes. Think about Gainesville, Florida, home of the University of Florida. So every year, 20,000 new people show up. If it was Forsyth County, you'd have 20,000 people just driving around in circles because there's no way to tell where you need to go here. But you get all those new students in every year. They even spray paint the road ranges at the beginning and the ends of the roads to help people. Um, in Washington, D.C., think about it. You not only have tourists coming in, but think of all the people from different countries who are coming in there to do work with our federal government. So to have something that's easy and predictable makes Washington work. It's, it's very important to them to keep those addresses going so we can keep commerce and business going. So street names, parts of the address, they need to be unique. It's better if they're patterned. Uh, house numbers, think about the size, the style. Um, are they gonna be just numerically based? Are they gonna be calculated into that road range? So house numbers as part of your address tell you something. And street types, we talked a little bit about this, Gainesville, Florida, you know, avenues only run north-south, roads only run east-west. You know, what's a way, what's a court? Does that tell you any information about the address? If I say it's a court, do you know what? You know, here in Forsyth County, you don't really, but other places, it, it could tell you something. And I know I've talked a lot about American addresses because well, that's where we are. It's more interesting in some respects because it relates to us. But I also think addressing around the world is very interesting because it's very, very different. If you go to Japan, streets aren't named. You're not going to get any information about a location off a street name. They just don't name them. What they have are municipalities that they break down into smaller units that they break down into blocks. So now you have a block of houses. And in that block of houses, so you've got your municipality as a number, your block is a number. The houses that go around, they are numbered by the year they were built. So it's oldest to newest. So number one might be next to number 47, which might be next to 23, which might be next to four. Can anybody think of why they would do that? Go right at the bottom. It's a culture that really respects um, age and wisdom. So the oldest houses are the most respected and they keep the numbers, the lowest numbers. 
So it's very culturally based and very respectful. It's completely incomprehensible. If you go to Japan, you have to do what the locals do. If you go to a new place, you go to the police station and ask the police officer, I'm trying to find this house, how do I get there? Because there, there's no way to predict it. You have to have somebody who has knowledge of that area help you find it. When you look at China, China, uh, its whole addressing system is based on the fact that it is very um, respectful of the compass and the compass points, the center points and the cardinal directions. So, you know, even the name China means the center. That's their whole culture, not the whole culture, a big part of the culture is based on this. And so all your streets are going to be divided into east or west or north or south. They start at this central point and then they go out. And so your numbers go out with them. And then as you go on the street signs, it'll tell you what quadrant of the city it's in, north, south, east, west, underneath it. So as you walk around the city, if you know the system, you actually know where you are not only on the block, but in the great scheme of the whole city. So it's, it's very interesting. And 10 points to Gryffindor, if you could tell me who invented the compass. No, not quite. <laughs> but it, it was a Chinese man named Quinn. Anyway, the Chinese invented the compass, so I guess it makes sense that they would have all of their stuff based on this concept. And if you even want to go look at Europe, Paris. Paris is very interesting. You can see that they want to make sure, you know, it's kind of a thing that people talk about, you know, Parisians being very proud of their city. But if you go to name a street, they have all these conditions, like if it's a big road, it has to have a big, great name that'll be remembered. Or if it's a street that, buys, that goes by a church, it's got to be named after a saint or a famous, you know, French preacher. Um, neighborhoods around industrial areas, those streets are named after famous French industrialists or inventors. Uh, and it just goes on and on. Uh, astronomers for by astronomy places and, and, and teachers. It's, you, know, you can see where they're just trying to inject more and more of their own culture, just even into the street name. All right, so I'm gonna wrap it up. Hopefully, give you something to think about with addresses. Um, interesting, they're recent, very new in America, like I said, pretty much the American Revolution kicked us off. Uh, they're developed primarily for commerce, emergency services, and for the government. Um, and addressing is fundamentally a part of the cultural identity of, of a country and of an individual. And ideally, it helps if addresses are predictable, but they're meaningful.